uh, around the world. Before we begin, I would just like to acknowledge that tonight I'm uh, giving this uh, workshop from the lands of the Boyne Wurrung and the Woi Wurrung of the Kulin Nation in the west of Melbourne and to acknowledge the ancestors, elders and community members who have been the traditional custodians and current custodians of the land. We're very fortunate to uh, have the wealth of tradition around ethical conduct, uh, around looking after place, looking after people uh, and looking after planet that we have a lot of learning that's come from our Indigenous peoples here in Australia. I'm aware that many of you will be in different places around the world and uh, acknowledge the Indigenous peoples, First Nations peoples of your places. Um, and also to welcome my colleagues who are in many countries around the world. And we were insistent tonight that we would all try and come together to have this conversation about ethics with you uh, rather than just having me present it. So we have um, somebody in the UK, in Chile, in Malawi, in Nigeria, and in Italy. And hopefully that will uh, help give a bit of a diverse flavor to the conversation that we'll, we'll have this evening. So, uh, what, what is it that uh, brings us to this issue of ethical challenges? It's questions like when we're working with um, communities that are unfamiliar to us, how do we know whether we will do harm or add value to the community that we're working with? When we're working with people from different cultures and contexts, how do we know what's the strongest path to walk? How do we know if the decisions that we're taking are right or wrong for that place, for those people and for that time. Um, when we're working with a community uh, who ha perhaps has uh, low resource, is it an ethical thing to pay for people to participate so that they can have time away from their other responsibilities or duties? Or will that in fact introduce an ethical dilemma in terms of the likely information uh, and exchange that might go on in the context of that research. These are the sorts of questions uh, that really prompted our thinking and drew us together to uh, develop this toolkit that we'll be talking with you about this evening. And on that note, I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Clara Kalia, who's sitting in Italy, but is uh, usually based at the University of Edinburgh and who has been with me since the beginning of, of this project. Uh, at that time, we were both at the University of Edinburgh. I was with the Global Health Academy and Clara was with the Global Academy for Food Security and Agriculture. And our work together was, was in Malawi. Over to you, Clara. Thank you, Corinne. Uh, thank you all for joining us today uh, for this conversation about ethical challenges in global context. Uh, today we are here to, to share with you, Corinne, please, next slide. Um, thank you. Uh, so today we are here to share with you uh, an ethics toolkit to help us think through some of uh, the many complex ethical challenges that we face uh, as a researchers working in complex and fragile contexts around the world. Uh, we also discuss how our university and organization can help us to create an environment and culture that support ethical practice. Uh, here you can find even the link for the website of the toolkit that uh, we uh, developed that we are going to describe uh, uh, in this presentation. Next slide, please. So this has been a, a collaborative effort uh, from researchers from all around the world, uh, because this cannot be a unidimensional uni uh, conversation. One needs to be, uh, have many voices involved and to consider the richness and the diversity of the needs of, of uh, different experience. So, so far, more or less 200 global researchers participated to the conversation, and uh, these are the one uh, highlighting in this map in the uh, dark blue. And as you can see, even uh, different university and institutions uh, contributed to the conversation. Next slide. So we uh, have representation from across uh, uh, our di disciplinary and uh, professional area. Uh, and as you can see, uh, more or less over 60 disciplines participated to the conversation. 
because we believe that this needs to be a collaborative effort so, and uh, uh, developing a common language is important when we talk about ethical uh, dilemmas and uh, solutions. So the toolkit that we are going to present today um, represents uh, the uh, different perspective and a, a multidisciplinary approach. We all know that when we work in a global context, uh, we work most of the time in uh, uh, multidisciplinary projects. And uh, uh, so it's, it's really important that we represent this uh, multidisciplinary approach, even in the toolkit. So it doesn't represent only one area of uh, expertise and professions. So uh, next slide. So over the last year and a half, as Corinne was mentioning today, uh, we work on the development of the toolkit that has been uh, in a way uh, a journey for us. And everything started, it all started by involving people. Uh, one year and a half ago, we uh, organized five uh, uh, workshops at the University of Edinburgh, and we were amazed by the number of uh, uh, researchers working global context interested to participate in the discussion, uh, talking about ethical dilemmas and uh, uh, challenges that we all face. Uh, we identify so many differences, um, but also uh, many uh, similarities. In parallel, we also run, uh, we also did a, a scoping review from the literature identifying um, 60 found, uh, 65 uh, uh, papers and uh, uh, this uh, uh, gave us uh, the strength of the uh, theoretical uh, background that has been then representing the toolkit. At the same time, we also uh, review the current uh, world, uh, world view value system and policies in uh, ethics uh, uh, regulations. And uh, we identify a variety of, of key ethical principles. And uh, uh, together, uh, we summarize what emerged from the conversation with people, from the literature and uh, from the principle, and uh, we uh, draft the first version of the toolkit, uh, which uh, will be described uh, will be described later by Corinne. <clears throat> As you can see, is is a is a, is a journey to summarize the key point of, of, from these different aspects. Uh, this first draft. Uh, we, after the design of the first draft, we come back to the people that initially were uh, participated to the discussion and we ran uh, 16 uh, uh, expert feedback sessions around the world, more or less uh, one year ago. So participants of the, of the first workshop became then host of the discussion in their own institution involving the further uh, researcher uh, uh, to provide us feedback to the first version of the toolkit. Uh, then after the, the, the revision of the first version, we create uh, the, the, the toolkit, which is now available in the website. This is uh, the link and uh, which is also uh, summarized in a pocket version now translated in, in uh, 11 languages. And now off back to Corinne. Thanks, Clara. Yes, indeed, it has been quite a journey. And for us, I think the key messages that have come out of those conversations with uh, the more than 200 researchers have been quite powerful in driving us on to, um, to share that uh, collective knowledge with others. Uh, one of the key messages that came from each of those roundtable conversations was a feeling of not being alone anymore, that researchers have been facing these challenges by themselves and wondering whether uh, their struggles were just a reflection of perhaps a, a lack of experience on their part or a lack of skills. And yet when people came together, we would hear the same stories and the same messages over and over again. I think perhaps most importantly, what came out of those conversations was an understanding that uh, ethics is not about a set of rules. It's not about uh, following uh, a set of demands or, or guidelines. It's really about having an ethical worldview, having a really clear set of values that can guide your decision making when perhaps you're in a context where your usual rules don't fit or the circumstance is unique. It was very clear in these conversations that although most universities think uh, uh, of ethics as a, a point in time when you uh, 
submit your ethics proposal to an ethics committee for approval and then you move on to your research. Rather than that, what we found was that researchers identified ethical dilemmas and challenges that they faced from well before the ethics committee had an opportunity to look at their application and lasted well after their approval had been in place, all the way from the very beginning to the end of their research journey. So it was not simply a paperwork hurdle. Uh, being ethical, taking an ethical approach really requires that we have an ethical mindset all the way from beginning to end and beyond and a commitment to good practice, uh, both our own good practice and the good practice of those that we're working with. Moreover, our uh, groups from all countries identified that there were not one or two ethical dilemmas or challenges, but dozens and dozens of them. In fact, in every roundtable discussion that we had, we got people to put up uh, sticky notes on the walls around uh, the room that we were holding uh, the, the sessions in. And inevitably, the walls would get filled up, that there would be so many ethical challenges that people could identify all the way throughout their, their research experience. It also became clear to us that there were four consistent themes that kept coming up, and we'll talk about them a little bit later on, that helped people to understand uh, the ethical challenges that they were facing. Understanding the place in which it was occurring or the context, the people who were involved or affected, the principles that were driving the decision making um, and the precedents for what happened, what usually happened in that place or what had happened in the past. Another key message was from all participants is that it's not enough to simply uh, acknowledge ethical dilemmas uh, or think uh, through why the, these challenges are difficult to face. We must take ethical action. It must flow through to the choices we make and the actions that we take. We must be committed to seeing through those ethical uh, values to their ultimate conclusion. And one important way of supporting one another to take ethical action and to understand ethical challenges is to share case studies and share solutions. As researchers, we can sometimes work in a bit of a solo universe just within our own team. And there was a really strong uh, will and commitment from each of the research conversations that we had that we really need to join up as a global academic village to support one another in supporting the communities that we work with to ensure that we share um, our challenges and our solutions. And that there is inspiration and wisdom to be found in all of the different places that, uh, that we work and that we do our research. It's not simply that one place or one country or one uh, political system or one way of thinking has all of the answers. Quite the opposite, uh, that inspiration and wisdom comes in many forms in many places. And that context matters. What might be the right solution to an ethical dilemma in one place may not be the right solution in another. And that there will be more than one solution. Moreover, that there may be no perfect solution. We may be choosing between really complex and challenging options, each of which has an element that works and an element that doesn't. I'm going to uh, hand over now to Action Amos, who is our colleague in Malawi. And he will talk us through the, the research journey that has come out of these conversations with researchers. Over to you, Action. Uh, thank you, uh, Corinne. So just like any other journey that uh, one would uh, embark on, uh, there are certain considerations that one has to uh, take uh, into consideration. It might be at the start of that journey uh, and even think about the end of that journey. But uh, as you think about that journey, you do not uh, only think about uh, the start and the end, you also think about uh, other things in between uh, your starting point to your end point. So as uh, Corinne uh, mentioned, that uh, we brought uh, in a lot of uh, research experts, over 200, uh, to have uh, discussions around uh, what matters uh, along this uh, journey. It was like uh, bringing in, uh, you know, pilots that have traveled uh, this uh, uh, certain routes, different routes, to talk about uh, the challenges and issues that, uh, that they would uh, face and how uh, their gains can be improved. So key things that came out uh, that needs uh, consideration as you start, as you move, as well as you end with four 
uh, P's that will later on uh, be explained better. Uh, issues to do with the place, uh, issues to do with the, the people, be it the participants, uh, the communities, the researchers uh, uh, themselves. Uh, secondly, the, the principles, the principles which we can li uh, liken them to, to you know, uh, to, to guides that you would uh, need to keep on remembering uh, all along your uh, journey. And also precedents. As we have said, we have brought in a lot of uh, researchers together. So uh, there's a lot of precedents on the work that has been done. What can we learn and uh, what can be improved along uh, uh, the, the journey. So the journey uh, does not uh, start maybe when you're submitting your uh, ethical ap application for approval, but it's when the, the ideas are seeded. That's when we say we need to be thinking about uh, the ethics. We need to think about the people we'll be working with, uh, those that will be beneficiaries, those that will be researchers. What are the ethical implications uh, that we have to think along with the idea that we are putting on the on the table. Usually we do not uh, think about uh, ethics as we start uh, putting up ideas, but uh, from what we learned and um, what we're working on now is to ensure that uh, we improve, uh, especially on that uh, area. When we are putting up uh, our teams, so we usually think about uh, the ethics around uh, uh, the teams that we'll be working with. It's not only the principal investigators, not uh, the core uh, investigators, it might be the research assistants, it might be uh, anyone that will be part of that uh, team. How about the diversity to reflect uh, the research that we will be doing? Do we think about uh, that? At times we might uh, even look at uh, issues like uh, participatory uh, engagements with those that are even the, the beneficiaries of our uh, research. So all those things we are thinking with an ethical lens to ensure that the team that even that has been developed ethically it's uh, sound. You took we talk also about uh, another note which is the partnership uh, development. Do we take into consideration uh, ethical consideration, so to say, about uh, who is going to be part of the work that we are doing? Usually we don't. We think about uh, uh, the outcome, the outputs, and say, okay, we're going to produce a paper. So for this paper to be, uh, then we just identify those that are maybe uh, within the proximity and uh, who are able uh, you know, to, to work with us at that given time. But there is need to ethically think about uh, those uh, partnerships, which means that not all partnerships are, are partnerships. Ethics have to be considered on who we, uh, are going to work with and who are going to contribute and add value to the work that we will be doing. Now comes another note, which is the proposal uh, and grant development, and, uh, getting the, the funds. Again, we need to keep on going back. You remember the four Ps we talked about, are they still being reflected in the uh, submissions we are going to make, the grants that, are they talking to Yes, in which areas can we improve, can we enhance our application as we submit it? Then comes now the ethics application itself, we now submit it. We're just not submitting to meet the requirements of a, an ethics committee. Just say, okay, these are their four, five, seven requirements that they need and those are the ones, but we still need uh, to be professional enough to even add more to ensure that uh, we strengthen uh, issues to do with ethics in research. Now the data collection begins again. We need go, to go back. So as we had already mentioned, when we likened this even to a literal journey, yes, you are now in the middle of your journey. You think about where you have come from. At times you even think about, well, when I was leaving my house, did I, did I lock all the doors? Did I lock the gate? The same applies with this journey again. We are moving along that journey. We go back and say, okay, we submitted that application. We are doing the data collection. When we're putting up the idea first, what ethical things did we say, issues that we say we're going to consider? We re review, revise, and even improve at that further um, stage, despite that we had already submitted or it has already been approved. This shows the professionalism and also the considerations that we 
have. And as we now develop uh, the tools and everything, we get to data analysis, still the same ethical lens. We are writing up now, we have done the analysis, and now we have our themes and ever we are now putting the paper, we still need to go back and think about, uh, you know, our other nodes or other stops where we stopped and thought about it and ensure that still we are being inclusive in terms of uh, uh, the ethics or we still have that uh, ethical lens. Then comes um, knowledge uh, exchange and dissemination. Here comes now a challenge we have uh, done our write-up, but we usually forget. Uh, that's where now the issue to do with sustainability of uh, research starts from. We're talking about the knowledge exchange. Who do we need to exchange knowledge with? Are we going to share this uh, information with policymakers? Are we going to share this information with the participants? Uh, were we, um, how genuine were we involving the participants? What's their benefit in terms of uh, knowledge? Are we just leaving them as they are and just present our papers wherever we present them? But we need to think about uh, the knowledge exchange. We have gained knowledge. We are going to sh uh, share knowledge with the uh, scientific world, but also even with our participants. Translation into practice. Again, the uptake of our research. How ethical is it? We can produce as many papers as we can. But how many of those papers have now been translated into action, into policies, or how many, much of it has been, uh, the, the uptake, how much has it been? So all that uh, needs uh, to be considered. And lastly, it's uh, the legacy, the impact. You know, we need to end our journey with all the responsibilities. Do, do we, uh, what consequences? We need to take responsibility of the good things that has happened within the research, as well as uh, take responsibility of even the things that did not work. By doing so, we would have shown throughout the journey that we were ethically sound. We did not at one point remove our eth ethical classes as we were doing this way. So it's very important that we consider this journey. And that's why we intend to continue improving uh, this uh, research uh, journey as a team, as well as with others that will be uh, joining us as, uh, in this way. So back to you, Corinne. Thank you, Action. And I'm gonna hand over now to Dr. Toby Ashodi, who is joining us from Nigeria this evening, or this morning, I think your time, Toby. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. It's morning, actually. Yes. Um, thank you, Corinne. Well, uh, Action just talked about the research journey, as well as Corinne talking about that same journey. And in the presentation, one recurring issue is the four Ps. So what is the four Ps? The four Ps is simply an opportunity. You know, it offers us as researchers not only to embed ethics along the journey, but also to engage the ethical dilemmas and find solutions to those problems. As researchers global, working on global challenges, we research in a particular place. A place for us in the toolkit encompasses not only the location, but the context of that place, the local culture, the language, the political economic con context, the humanitarian situation. If you're working in a refugee, if you're working among refugees, how do you reflect that reality in your research? How do you? Then of course, it also talks about the people and people for us is also multidisciplinary, it's also multidimensional. It goes beyond the researcher to include the participants, the communities, as well as the partners, the funding agencies, and even the government. So funding, I mean, people is not only about the individual researcher, it goes beyond those as researchers. Then of course, the principles, we've been hearing about the principles. Of course, the principles are those values. Of course, expected methodological rigor, how fit is our, 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 put, our, our methods. Then of course, about transparency and accountability. We need to show what we've done openly, honestly to you know, our audience, because as researchers, we have audience probably in terms of at the end, you know, the end product of our research that uh, Action talked about. 
Then precedence. Precedence is the fact that what we are doing today or tomorrow is not new. Other researchers before us did something like that. What was their ethical protocol like? What challenges did they face? How can we make our own research better than the ones we met? Then of course, presidents is not only about the literature, also the traditional ways of knowing things. And we call the sans people in 2017 reminded us about these traditional ways of doing things. That it is not only the researchers that understands ethics, even ethics, even uh, the participants also have an understanding of what ethics are. So it is not only, presidents is not only about the literature, understanding what previous researchers did, the methods they followed, but also traditional ways of knowing things. And traditional also encompasses the communities that we are looking at. And of course, future proofing. After our research, what are we leaving for the next generation of researchers to learn from? We should share what we've learned so that others can actually improve on it. Uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll go back to Karen. Karen. Thank you, Toby. Fantastic. And that'll come in very handy for our discussion in a little while. So I think it's really important that um, we take some time in this session today to put the toolkit into action and see if we can work through some of the ethical dilemmas that, uh, that our researchers and others have talked with us about uh, to see how this way of thinking, this toolkit and some of the, the approaches that we've just discussed can be of, of use to us. I guess the putting, putting the different elements together, the research journey and the four Ps, provides us with a framework to walk through any particular case that we might come across, any particular situation or circumstance that we might find ourselves in where the answers are not obvious and where perhaps um, we're struggling to find uh, it within our own experience or skill set to know what to do. It helps us to, to lead through a process that you can see here in this slide where we start on the left hand side describing the ethical issue that, uh, that is confronting us to really uh, try to uh, make it real and tangible by putting it into words. And then to think about what part or parts of the research journey are most affected by this particular ethical issue. Where does the challenge um, uh, hit its most powerful point? It's unlikely that it will just be at one of these stages. Very often it's at several of the stages. And so the second column here is to encourage people to um, walk through and really think as um, Action was saying when he walked through the research journey, to think carefully and iteratively, even if you didn't imagine that that if, if ethical issue uh, might have influenced, for example, uh, the development of your team. Later down the track, you may come to the view that in fact it did influence the development of your team. Um, that perhaps when you wrote your ethics application, it seemed that this wasn't an ethical issue to you, but by the time you get to um, data collection, it's clear that it is an ethical issue. So really trying to think systematically through which parts of the research journey are most affected. And then the first, I guess, port of call then is to use the 4P approach to do some analysis to understand the dilemma best before we try and find a solution to really have a rich, deep understanding of what the, the challenge is. And thinking through place, people, principles and precedents in the context of that dilemma can really help us to ask ourselves questions that perhaps haven't been immediately obvious. And, and I should say, not just ask ourselves, often these, um, it's really important to have these conversations with others and between you, amongst your team, you may draw out different elements that you perhaps didn't see, but somebody else could see. And that the sum total of your experience and your uh, perceptions will often provide a much stronger foundation to think about ethical issues. And so once we understand the dilemma, once we've really dug a bit deep into that, laid out a, a rich landscape, we then need to reflect again using the four Ps and then move on to think about uh, in each of those areas, what solutions might be available to us if we step outside or step beyond what we have known or done before, what new opportunities might there be if we engage with 
different stakeholders or consider the context in a different way or engage with principles um, that we haven't perhaps considered before. And along the bottom here, you can see the core values that kept coming up and being presented by the researchers in these conversations. Uh, they were really um, consistent over time uh, with different researchers from different countries, with more experienced researchers as well as junior career researchers. There are some essential principles and so putting them along the bottom here really is a reminder to infuse our thinking with these principles of doing no harm, um, of working from a perspective that is about enabling the flourishing of others, uh, that we need to connect first with the needs of people and place and planet that we need to be aware, but also to be brave and to act, uh, to follow up our concerns, but also to be safe. And that safety is about ourselves, but it's also about our research team. It's about the communities that we're working with. Um, sometimes there are unintended consequences for unintended um, members of communities. We need to really keep that value at heart when we're making decisions about how to proceed, who will be impacted in what way, who will be put in harm's way, um, how, how do we mitigate that? I think investing in our own learning is critical. It's really key to keep updating our skills and our knowledge and to make sure that we keep learning and um, engaging with the possibility that there is more that we don't yet know. Context and compassion, again, has been a really key value that has come up time and time again. And then a commitment. Solving ethical dilemmas often does not come easy. Uh, one of our participants talked about taking the long road. Sometimes we just have to show determination and commitment. If it doesn't work the first time, if we don't get it right the first time, we ought not give up. We have to come back and rethink as Action was talking about earlier, come back to the research journey, use those four P's again and see what we've missed and what opportunities there might be. I'm going to hand over now to uh, Chris, Guerra, Chris Guerra, who, uh, who is coming to us from Chile uh, this morning, this evening, Chris. Maybe one Okay. <laughs> Hello. Hello. And we are going to present a brief case analysis to, to do an example of the use of the toolkit. And please imagine you are working in a refugee camp and your colleague uh, wants to do a clinical trial to test a COVID vaccine, okay? In, of course, in the refugee camp. But the, the ethical issue is you are not sure if the refugees can give a proper consent, given first, a lower level of literacy, second, linguistic barriers, and third, high expectations, okay? And the issue, of course, is detected at the beginning of the research journey, but you have to reflect on it during the, all the steps of the research journey. And to understand the dilemma, uh, we can use the 4P model in which in the specific place you are doing the research in this refugee camp, um, you need to consider that a successful vaccine would be really, really helpful in the refugee camp, given the uh, condition the people uh, are living there. And about the people, you have also to consider in this specific place, the people, the refugee in this case, are really anxious to receive help, to receive support, and they have high expectations, but they are not understanding, understanding the risks. Okay, it's an important thing to consider. About the principles, maybe you can think it in terms of risk versus benefits. And also it's important to consider the uh, proper process of informed consent. And finally, at the precedence level, um, you have to know uh, there is some evidence that high expectations over expectations affect the decision in the consent process. Um, the next please, Corinne, thanks. Uh, and about the ethical reflection, you can use the same four P's to reflect. For example, the place. You have to consider in the camp, there are a hierarchical structure. There are leaders, 
leaders validated by the other people, by the community. People within the, the, that leaders, there are some people with knowledge about medicine. And also they are willing to help you uh, as a mediators between the research team and the community. Uh, in the principles levels, you think uh, you will not do the research until participants understand the risks and benefit. This is a principle you need to respect. Um, and also the precedents, um, you do some research, you do some research, and you know there are previous research who faced the same, the same uh, challenge. You can use that precedent as a model, okay, to find a solution. Considering all of this analysis, you can um, uh, propose a solution, the ethical response. And please, Corinne, the next one. Thank you very much. Considering, considering all of this, you decide with your research team to meet the community leaders and to work with them uh, as, a, as a part of a collaboration. And with the community leaders, leaders' help, you decide to organize workshops to explain the community, the, the research, the benefits, and also the risks. You can also do um, uh, individual interviews with potential participants in local language to explain the, the risk. And finally, you decide to do a revision of the process of consent during all the research journey to be sure the people are uh, really uh, agree in agreement with the participation. So that, that's an example. It's not useful in all the research, but probably it would be a good solution in this case. Thanks, Corinne. Thank you, Chris, that's fantastic. I'm just gonna stop sharing uh, the screen for now and, um, and invite any comments or thoughts so far or any questions that anybody might have. And maybe we'll work through a couple of examples together to see how the, the toolkit can be of use here. Now, I'm just mindful that I'm just checking that the screen share has actually stopped. Yes, it has. Yes, great. Okay, excellent. Okay, so I guess, you know, when, we're, when we were thinking about this research toolkit, um, it wasn't an easy process for, uh, for many researchers to immediately um, think about ways that, or, or immediately think about the most challenging uh, issues that they were facing and to put it into practice. So it really, it is an opportunity to walk through a few more case examples to just make sure that those core principles make sense to people. Can I just check the chat line and see whether anybody has put any on the Padlet? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know, can you see something? I'm just having a look now, Clara. No, nope, I don't see. So we, we are also all aware that we, we are presenting a new framework to see ethical challenges and solution that is kind of new. And uh, we, we, we would like to stimulate discussion among you that decide to participate uh, to the workshop. Because the other key point that we are going to describe even later, this is an ongoing discussion. This is not a project. We are we are thinking this project of ethical discussion as, a, as an ongoing discussion. Again, it's a journey. And we are learning so much through the journey. And uh, we are part of this journey now for us. So any kind of feedback or, or questions uh, will help us to reflect about uh, what I've been doing so far. And um, so please feel free to contribute and, and ask us questions before uh, we, we, we go ahead. Um, could I just uh, maybe share some reflections uh, yes. of some of the research that I've done? I think um, as I'm speaking from a, a, an Australian context where I've done research that's, um, that's been funded through community organizations or by government funding. 
and I, I'm always conscious of the funding source and and why why research is needed for a particular thing and if it is really needed and have we bothered to ask people whether they would even want to participate or want to or see that that whole concept is a necessary one. Um, so I've, I'm, I'm particularly thinking of a project where I worked with some refugee men of Muslim backgrounds, very diverse ethnic backgrounds, and um, <clears throat> the whole model about how that came about, how, how a research project came about, was in response to, you should just run a project with Muslim men because there's money there, and that project had nothing to do with research. So instead of just assuming what men needed or wanted or would find useful, we decided to ask them. And then they participated in a research pro uh, process with us. And it was really interesting um, just working through that particular project. How the, I think someone, I don't know whether it was Toby who said or, or Acton that said, people have very high expectations that they want the research to have well, when I heard that, I thought it made me think about how the men I worked um, alongside had a very high expectation of what that research could possibly do. Uh, and it was a lot higher than what I thought the research could deliver. So we had to have some discussions about what the parameters and where this would go and where it would reach and who would read it and, and how it might help but we couldn't promise the moon with it. Um, so, you know, those sorts of, and, and it's fragile and it's sensitive because people give of themselves willingly when they decide to go on this journey. And it's such an honor to be part of that process, really. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a process that needs to be honored. And, and I really like the, the model that you guys have developed. I think it's, it's, um, it's very positive. I like that. Can I just Thank check in, is it, is it Wafa? Is that your, is that how I pronounce your name? Yes, correct. Wafa. Um, what, the, a really interesting story and very uh, mirrors a lot of our own experiences in, in different places is that sometimes how a project comes about uh, can influence people's expectations, um, but, but very often um, the demands of particular funding sources or funding types also comes with uh, expectations or requirements and sometimes the fit is not so great uh, and one of the I think that the challenges is along the way is checking back about whether that funding source is the right funding source for the right people in the right place at the right time or whether it will add layers of constraint um, to that relationship or to that journey and it sounds like you walked that very sensitively you know by well, asking <laughs> it wasn't even meant to be funding for research it was meant to be mm -hmm. funding to run may i say um oh here's some money run some projects on domestic violence with Muslim men which carried a lot of assumption about what what the lives of Muslim men were automatically. And there were lots of workshops run on a whole range of issues, including when people have troubles, you know, when people have issues with families and where there might be violence, but they might not be, and they might be more interested in employment and how they get their qualifications recognized because a lot of these people were very well qualified, but had no jobs. Um, and we're trying to, you know, so there were many, you know, there was an educational component, which is what the, the funding originally was all about, but very specific in one area only. And we decided to turn that around and say, well, actually, what do the what do the men want themselves? And would they be willing to be part of a research project where we can find out what it is that men want? And it was a really valuable and instructive, and, and I was going in as a woman doing this research with men. And um, <clears throat> so the level of trust and respect that there was there was, you know, it was absolutely priceless. I cherish it to this day. Um, so it, it was, and, and I've been involved with other projects that come with money that say, you know, here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's some money. We want you to find out this about young Muslim people, young people. And it is, it is laden with, again, assumptions about 
while the while the other funding did, wasn't about research, but we used used a, used a, a research model to try and inform things in a positive way. So to turn something around and, and make it more inclusive, but with with funding that was said, well, here you go, here's some money, run and find out what what sort of influences how people think. And so we had to think very carefully and it was part of a very large academic, we had a very large academic um, uh, team, um, you know, esteemed professors and the rest of it. And uh, we had to think very ethically about what it was and how would we be involved and what we would be prepared to do and what we wouldn't be prepared to do. So those ethical questions were really upfront and, um, tense and um, amazing, really an amazing process. So, you know, and it, it came out, we came out with a very incredible project at the end of it that I think, you know, the, the participants hopefully would feel proud about. And, and along that journey, you, know, you mentioned that uh, engaging as a woman in some spaces uh, in research can have quite an impact on on both yourself, but also on, on the process and on the, the intent of the project. How, how was that journey for you when you found yourself in, in that unusual situation of, of working as a, a woman uh, where it sounds like the, the topic was quite a, a challenging and sensitive topic um, in a context that again, added another layer uh, you know, of sensitivity. That's right. I mean, it was at a time when, um, Muslim men were demonized in the, in the media and politically as well by our political leaders. So it, it you know, there was all, you know, when we're talking about place and context uh, on your place um, uh, diagram, you know, that it, it was laden with, with many, many different things. So it, it, we had a good committee. We, we were able to talk through things and, and work out you know, what we could do to use this project so that it would empower men rather than have them feel. And at the same time, give them lots of information that they required and they, they needed and we identified were, were needed because we had people in, you know, they would be using that community centre. So we knew what their issues were and we were trying to assist them with what it is that they had. So on, there was an assistance side to it, there was an educative side and there was a research side, which was about, about that future proofing as well. It's about what can we put in there in the field that can help to perhaps um, inform how we might move forward and what we really need now, but how we might move forward. So it's written from a community context. So it has some recommendations in it. It's written as a report to a community organization. Um, so yeah, in, in that sense. Yeah, it was a very, very um, amazing process, all I can say very multi-layered but I'm, I'm not going to hog the conversation here would anybody else like to uh, offer a reflection to Wafa or anybody else uh, like to raise a, an ethical challenge I noticed Jenny just joined us hi Jenny <laughs> how are you oh but you're on mute Jenny yes, sorry I was in another uh, um Work one, and I just came in here, so I didn't catch the very beginning. But um, what what was the question? <laughs> I, I wasn't putting you on the spot for a question. I was just just welcoming you. I noticed that you'd <laughs> arrived in the room. It was it was nice to see you. Um, so those, and I hear that the conference has been going very well. So congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> We were just talking through some of the uh, the ethical challenges that people come across in working in complex contexts and uh, and utilising, I guess, an opportunity to think about how along the research journey at different times and in different places we come up against things that uh, really put pressure on us to think carefully about the impact that we're having, um, about preemptively the kind of impact that we might have and trying to think that through before um, stepping in um, in, a, in a thoughtless way or in a way that's likely to leave stronger footprints than we might have, uh, have intended or decided. Um, 
And well, I guess... thank you for, yeah, thank you for repeating that. And sorry to everyone who already <laughs> heard it. That sounds really interesting to hear a second time. Maybe I'll, I'll just share something from the presentation I was just in, which is a project that uh, I've been working on with uh, Chris Son and Kim Shearson and Gavin Ivey, which is a, a kind of a meta evaluation, or that seems a grand word, of a range of projects for gender equality that uh, Vic Health, which is a Victorian body for um, uh, supporting health promotion that we have in Australia, um, provided uh, a range of small grants to community organisations and councils for people to undertake an arts-based project uh, for the purposes of uh, gender equality. So it was sort of broad. And then we received all these fantastic projects with the brief to help them evaluate and do a meta-evaluation. And uh, we were just reflecting on the fact of the importance of relationship, which I, I think people have repeatedly commented on, uh, but uh, how that can be really actually quite difficult in practice when you're coming into something like that. And things are always more rushed than you would like. <laughs> uh, so it would be nice to have, you know, three months to have prepared for that activity, but, you know, the grant arrives and there you are. Um, and uh, just the importance of relationship and taking the time to get to know some of the people in the projects, but, uh, and hearing what they said, and one of the issues they struggled with was the type of pushback they received in some areas, particularly in rural areas of Victoria around some of the arts projects they'd done and people not, not liking the message or feeling it was somehow anti-men and, and uh, yeah, helping them think perhaps about what you're saying there, not so much only us, but helping people we're working with think about what impact they're wanting to make and how to think about really difficult issues like that. Um, uh, and yeah, how you, might, how you might engage people in ways that bring them with you, but when to stand up and say, well, you have a little bit of power of the university behind you and say, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to perhaps accept certain behaviours or, or certain, um, you know, uh, elements of pushback and, and trying to kind of navigate that. So I hope that's a bit on topic, but that's one reflection. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if anybody else would like to pick up on the issue of relationships. I think that's kind of a, a key thread there. Maybe, Clara, you would like to talk some about, or Toby. Yes, I, I sorry, sorry for bringing you back slightly, but I was actually trying to reflect on what Wafa just talked about when she was talking about negotiating between what the funders want on the one hand and what, you know, you know, the implication of the assumption that the, you know, the funds, you know, add, trying to navigate, trying to meet with the funders to somehow adjust you know, th th their expectations. And one of the things we are also trying to do is also to bring in the funders into the e conversation on ethics. You know, beyond researchers, we are also trying to bring on board the funders so that this also can also have a kind of understanding also, you know, make their points. You know, because when, when you talked about maybe Muslim men, you know, domestic violence and those kind of assumptions. There will be certain, you know, underlining motivations for that kind of, you know, funding that kind of a research. But not bringing them on board, not bringing them, inviting them to the conversation on ethics may also be leaving out very important stakeholders. So I just wanted to quickly mention that one of the things that we're also hoping to do is beyond having the conversation with researchers, we're also inviting funders to come along this discussion of ethics along the research journey. So I just wanted to quickly amount that point. It's a, it's a really key point, I think. Rafa, you look like you had- Yeah, no, I agree. Start. I agree. We, we had those discussions and tried to bring them to the table and, and tried to maximise what we could out of that. Um, so there was a, it was a process of negotiate, negotiating um, in both those sorts of situations. And um, first and foremost was the issue of ethics in both of those situations. 
And uh, I'm not sure that, you know, some, you, you, you're never sure how much people take on board or really do understand at the end of the day. But I guess what we were able to achieve with, with those two projects was a set of parameters which allowed us to be able to move on and work ethically. And um, so um, I absolutely hear you. And I, I think that that's maybe we need to be even more conscious of that when we set those things up. Uh, I, I think that broader issue also does relate to um, the point that Jenny was making, that relationships and the negotiation of the relationships and conversations uh, is often the hardest piece. <laughs> the data collection uh, itself and the data analysis is, is sometimes quite straightforward, but it's thinking about that people part, the, the people in the four Ps and who are the stakeholders that need to be involved at each stage of the conversation. Who are the stakeholders that need to be there from the beginning? Um, who are the stakeholders that need to be there all the way through? And then there are kind of specialist stakeholders uh, that need to be brought in or, or, or at least can be helpful to be brought in at, at different points along the way. And I guess one of the challenges is if you are working in complex circumstances with challenging topics, then it's really routine for there to be relationship stresses and struggles along the way. So even when relationships start out well, which I guess is where it links in with what Jenny was saying, is that those relationships can be strong and sound at the beginning and you can go in with a lot of confidence that um, in fact this is a good partnership and that it will underpin the project really soundly. Uh, but along the way things can change and evolve and sometimes they change for the better and uh, things get stronger but other times they get a bit wobbly or it becomes clear that, that there are different motivations at play. Uh, different people are in it for a different reason or perhaps um, you know there, there comes a fork in the road where there's an interpretive difference or a choice point about uh, what, what questions to ask, what not to ask, um, how to pursue the things that are feeling particularly sensitive um, and, and also how to repair uh, those relationship ruptures when they happen. Um, so I think, you know, noticing when relationships have, have been put under so much strain that they've really broken a little bit under, under that pressure. Is it still ethical to continue uh, a, a joint research project if you know that the relationships are no longer uh, robust? Is, is really challenging, although it sounds like Jenny's team managed to, um, to find a way <laughs> to um, ma make their, their voice heard and at the same time try to create a respectful space for others along the way. Can I ask how others have, held, have dealt with high expectations amongst participants? Yeah. Chris, do you want to have a go at that one? So could you repeat the question? I was just wondering how people dealt with high expectations amongst participants, uh, research you know, people that you've, you're, you're working with in terms of your research, how you might deal with very high expectations. Wow. It's, it's, I mean, yeah, and do you find I, that that's an issue? It, it's an issue, it really. Uh, it's a, a, a big issue because I don't know. I think it's depend of the area of you are working on. Uh, but in, in my opinion, the, the important thing is to be honest. The, the principles Corinne uh, show us in the template at, at the uh, at the end of the template is it's a basic thing. Be honest and and also take the time to explain the community, the the participants, the potential risks. Um, and, and I am also thinking in the, for example, in the underage people, uh, you need to take the time to be honest and to explain and to clarify the expectation. If not, you will get the consent, but you will not act ethically. That's, that's my opinion. And, and also, and also uh, I, I, I am thinking in the local regulations, because there are, there are different regulations to get the consent. Uh, for example, in my country, when you work with uh, underage people in the schools, you need to get the consent in three levels. Schools, parents, and kids. So you need to, to work 
in the expectations at the and that three levels. If you are working in a community, maybe you need to talk with, uh, first with the leaders of the community and then with the participant. But it's a bit it's a big issue, and I think the solution is depending on on the context. That's that's my opinion. Maybe I'll pitch in there and add something else. I think the, the challenge that I find is equally people um, having low expectations. So um, many of the communities that I've worked with have um, seen researchers come and go. <laughs> they they uh, even they have a name for it, which I, <laughs> I, won't, I won't bother bringing to the table, but I'm sure many of you have heard variants of, uh, of this experience where you, you come in and you think you're very excited and you know you're ready and raring to go and it's uh, it's taken a long road to get there and it's taken a while to get the grant funding and the ethics clearance and all of that and you get there and you're very excited to start and it's like um, you know folks are less than enthusiastic <laughs> about about participating and you know when you begin those conversations it's it's about well you know how do i even know that you're going to see this through how do i know that you're doing it for the right reasons how do i know um that in fact there's not a hidden agenda that you haven't shared with us how do i know um that you won't give up at the first sign of uh, a struggle because it's not going to be easy to do this work um, and so I think uh, for me, um, high expectations is, is challenging, but I think low expectations is equally uh, as challenging because um, I think in, in neither case can we proceed without addressing it. You know, for me, that's the ethical gate is, am I about to begin a process of data collection or engagement or whatever with, with an assumption that I'll be collecting valid data? Um, if the people that I'm working with, if one of the key stakeholder groups, uh, particularly if it's the participants, uh, are not really um, on the same page. We don't have a shared set of understandings or expectations or uh, commitments, then it, it, you, we have to very, you know, question ourselves very carefully about whether or not the research is ready to begin or whether there is a, a pre-piece of work to be done, which is about re-establishing the relationship and again in, in the context that I'm thinking sometimes um, you know in remote communities that I've worked in I, I don't live there and so sometimes it might be months between when we have first talked about a project with this community and then I've gone back um, to Perth or to Melbourne and you know done all of the the back work had a little bit of contact with some key people and then kind of fly back in when it's ready to begin meanwhile everybody's forgotten about it they haven't seen me for months even if they were enthusiastic at the beginning you know might have other things might have become more of a priority um, and so there's very good reason i think why those motivational rhythms uh, might be different for the research team and for the participant team for the funding team um, for the community the broader communities um, and one of the challenges i think is both to know that to have a an expectation that those rhythms are going to be challenged and that our challenge is to try and make sure that they're complementary at the point where we're engaging around trying to to capture accurate and valid and helpful information and at the same time recognizing that sometimes no matter with the best will in the world it's just not the right time you know so sometimes also after after all of the hard work, getting there and going, well, actually, clearly, this is not the right time <laughs> to, be, to be engaging here. The community's focus is elsewhere or, you know, there are other impediments. Yeah, that I, I, I think, Corinne, just to chip in, at the time is that one of the key concepts uh, that, you know, both you and Chris were underlining. Because um, the, when, you, when we decide to take an ethical, you know, approach to our research project, so we, we also need to consider that time is a key element. Uh, for who was not present in the first part of the conversation, uh, uh, what we uh, described before, that ethics, uh, we are considering a uh, uh, shifting paradigm, a paradigm uh, thinking about ethics. That is, we, we, we don't want that is just a single moment in our uh, research journey, but it's something that happened through the journey. Sometimes we need to stop and reflect in a different part of uh, the, uh, our research project. So taking time and having time is an important part of our planning. Uh, and um, 
I, I'm just thinking, I, I, I'm the chair of, uh, of ethics in the, school, uh, in the School of Health and Social Science at the University of Edinburgh. In the last few months with COVID, uh, I just saw so many uh, ethical applications that ne needed to be reviewed super quick because the uh, research project uh, was super necessary team were uh, react promptly, uh, promptly to the funder, to the cause, and uh, we, we are being asked to review ethical applications related to COVID uh, with a different speed. As you can imagine, this required a big pressure to um, ethics committee. Uh, and so time is a key element, even this moment uh, that we are all facing uh, this big challenge with COVID. Uh, are we ready to, to review application related to COVID quick? Who, who has the expertise to review quickly an application with so many ethical challenges? Do we need to be quick? Even you, this conversation starting about team development, team organization, again, this, this requires time. And we know that uh, we need to consider this through, through, through our journey. This can be not applied to one single moment. So it's something that require reflection and we are here to, to, to discuss with you and see if you, if you share and uh, uh, the same ethical dilemmas or a solution. And uh, so yeah, time, I think that is one of the key words uh, to uh, our, our ethics journey. I was also wondering if everything was clear or the framework that we presented so far and uh, or summarize key point for who just join us uh, later about the research journey that we, we presented. I think Clara, um, because most because the the session has been recorded, it might be also that people may be able to give us those who weren't here for the beginning may be able to give us some feedback when they've had a chance to look at it af afterwards and to be in touch by, by email. But if I pick up on your thread about timing, I think one of the key learnings that we had come out of this project um, from you know, more than 200 researchers was that we're very focused in universities on the here and now. And one of the things that is getting really clear, certainly in the UK and Europe, not so much in Australia yet, is that as researchers, we also have a huge responsibility for the legacy impact of our work. So it doesn't, our responsibility doesn't just stop when the project is over. It doesn't just stop when we report back to uh, our funding bodies to say that we've collected our data, we've written our report. But in fact, the accountability and ethical responsibility for uh, our research lasts in perpetuity. So if um, a, a current participant perhaps uh, or a community that we've worked with, perhaps a year down the track or two years after the project is done, comes back and says, actually, you know, that, that left our community quite battered. Uh, it was unhelpful. It, it resulted in some unintended side effects and, and consequences in terms of perhaps political action or uh, some other response. Then there is a sense in which as researchers, we have some responsibility there or some accountability there. And so I think for, for us, um, as we develop the toolkit, this was something that we hadn't really factored in. That usually when we think about ethics, it really is put in your application, do your project, and then walk away. And actually the culture of research in the sector around the globe is shifting towards long-lasting uh, engagement or uh, thinking or thinking prospectively about the long-lasting uh, impact of what it is that we're proposing to do because not only is there a, a potentially a legal um, implication there's also a moral one uh, and and this was an interesting experience for us that some researchers after the fact felt as though perhaps uh, there were legacy impacts that they hadn't uh, in, hadn't counted on for the community but also for the researchers and that was the second piece that was uh, perhaps something that we we're, we're more surprised by. I think all of us who work in complex contexts know that we struggle ourselves sometimes with what we see and hear, um, with some of the data that we, some of the interviews that we listen to, with some of the actions that we see. Um, but there was a real uh, richness to the discussion 
in our roundtable sessions on the mental health and well-being of researchers who work in this space. And how do we as leads, as project leads, as CIs, as team leaders, think about the likely impacts of this difficult work that we do, prepare for it, um, prevent it and address it when, when we see it. You know, how do we respond when one of our team members looks as though they are really struggling and maybe we're in the middle of data gathering. You know, do, do we just push ahead because that's the person that we're relying on to collect our data? Um, or do we say, well, you know, actually the ethical choice here is to look out for that team member and make sure that they're okay. Or if it looks like the community is being impacted, do we push ahead regardless or do we stop and ask ourselves that question? So I'm kind of curious whether anybody else here has had uh, those sorts of challenges in the work that, that you do. Sorry, it's me, Renzo. And um, Hello. just how are you? Uh, just I was thinking a little bit about when you were um, presenting the, the the model, you know, and the example that you gave to you, and about choosing, you know, the representative from the community, and the impact that could have, particularly when you're working with cultural groups, but with different ethnics, you know, backgrounds, and the political, and particularly working in the refugee environment. And I mean, so the, the, the impact that could have in that. And I, and I think just that, um, but seeing your model that helps, you know, to place this in the context, I think is quite relevant. And I was thinking as well in terms of the, the reflection from your model, uh, for me is to start thinking a little bit about when we do research with vulnerable communities and the outcomes and with the politicians and, you know, especially in Australia where we are, the complexity that he has. But I've been thinking a little bit when you were presenting your model, it's about the impact that uh, has around the context, you know, and, and the systemic, systematic, you know, um, ethical committees that are, we are facing and the, the barriers that comes from there. You know, particularly with emerging communities when there is no interpreters, you know, there is like your case, there is no in, uh, qualified interpreters, and that means we have to use the community. Who we using in the community and the impact that it has on the results of the research, you know what I mean? And all the questions or the validity of the research, but as well, all the hurdles we need to go through, you know, with an ethical committee to try to work it out. That. And that means creates, for me, creates the model that you bring, I think brings to mind to me as an example of, you know, the barriers that comes from the institutions that we need to follow, the rules that we need to do, but as well as in another side is about how, you know, um, who we're choosing and how do we know that, um, and how long we're going for this or pursue for this when, you know, there is so many ethnic differences and different, and the consequences that brings when we contacting people or no. And usually it's the people who are linked to the organizations already in the context of Australia, you know. And that creates a lot of um, ethical dilemmas uh, for our work, you know, in some ways, you know, when we do that work. Renzo, so many things in there that I, I would love to follow up on, but rather than hog the conversation, I'm just going to choose one and then perhaps yeah, somebody, yes. else, somebody else might like to respond to you. Uh, but one of the things that one really important thread in what you were saying was how well our institutions or our universities are set up to support ethical research in complex contexts. And in fact, this is a very significant part of the work we're doing in phase two of the development of the toolkit is to try to provide some tools and templates for universities, for NGOs, um, and for other community organizations who are involved in, in these processes, because right now we are not well set up. So um, prior to, to coming to Victoria University, uh, in my current position, I worked uh, as the ethical lead at the University of Edinburgh. And one of the challenges that, that we had there uh, was that our systems presuppose a very traditional form of research. And it, it certainly does not accommodate that thinking that spans the beginning of the research journey all the way through to the end and to the legacy. It really doesn't think like that. So there are, I think, some really important cultural shifts to be going on in universities and in ethics committees 
things like we should expect that things will go wrong when people are working in complex contexts. That shouldn't be a reason for a sanction or a reprimand. That should be, if people are reporting it, which we want to do, we should be encouraging the reporting of that. We should be providing um, peer networks to be able to throw around ideas and where we've got stuck and share uh, knowledge, uh, which is partly why we've got the website and why we've developed the toolkit is so that we can around the world um, share these experiences together because our ethics committees at the moment uh, really I think could do with uh, a bit of uh, you know a modernization let's say where we understand that increasingly we will work in international teams so we will work across cultures we will work in contexts that are under pressure so a lot of us are working in areas uh, addressing the sustainable development goals for example so by definition we'll be working in uh, complex circumstances so ethics committees need to have processes that are not a single point in time because the ethical journey is ongoing it needs to be reiterative it needs to walk alongside us it needs to be agile and able to respond as things occur so we can preempt so many things but in com complex projects as you describe sometimes you don't know what's going to happen until it happens uh, and really our systems need to be set up so that we can both encourage the reporting of that and walk with us while we find a good solution to that. Um, and at the same time, I think that uh, making sure that our, our ethics committees are fit for purpose in that way um, just requires, I guess, a, an understanding that when ethical uh, practices in ethics committees were set up, which was, you know, some decades ago. <laughs> um, we l worked quite locally. We usually worked solo or with maybe one other. We didn't work in big teams. We didn't work in multidisciplinary teams. We didn't work in cross-cultural teams so much. Um, we worked, you know, in small scale, largely. Um, and now we work very differently. So I guess, you know, I, I completely agree with you. I think our systems uh, one of our, our um, current projects, our phase two of our current project is both at uh, Ed the University of Edinburgh and I hope that at Victoria University and um, I know Chris in, in Chile and uh, Toby in Nigeria and Action in Malawi will all be working with ethics committees and groups at their respective universities to implement these, this framework and this new understanding about how we should consider um, ethical challenges so that our ethics practices line up more strongly. Thank you. No, thank you. It's a great question. A great observation. Okay, did anybody else want to respond to Renzo? Any other aspect of, of his comment? Or we can maybe move on. Yeah, just, just to add, you know, some something more that, you know, uh, to reiterate what we already discussed, that ethics um, required uh, all uh, our involvement in considering it is not again as a single moment or so, so as a way to judge our methods, our project, as a way to, to support each other. So maybe uh, creating a conversation group in our institution can support every researcher from early career researcher to senior researcher to, to come together and discuss ethical uh, issues and challenges because we might find a solution, not only in principle, but just discussing with somebody that maybe already had the same difficulty and uh, might help us to think through the same problem from a different perspective. So one of, one of the aim of the project that we hope to, to reach through, through the year is to uh, come together. So it's, it's, a, it's a place, the toolkit where we can uh, support each other and discuss about ethical uh, uh, difficulties or, or solution. So um, for uh, who were not present before, the idea to create a website instead of a paper version of the toolkit is exactly for this reason. So everybody from every part of the world can get access to, to the toolkit and to the work we are developing. And we are developing this work together. So we are here together just uh, 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 we are just the represent, uh, representative of the team, but it's a conversation that is going on and uh, uh, you are more than welcome to join us in this conversation. And um, so yeah, a, a place to talk, to, 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 to support each other, not, not a place to, to, to judge each other. I come from an environment where, again, I think it's seen as a single moment and 
uh, really you would like to receive an approval from your project. But sometimes another challenge and when we work in multidisciplinary projects, uh, the project most of the time is reviewed by committees where the PI of the project is sit in the, uh, in the specific school, in the specific uh, part of the university. Why, when we work in complex projects, uh, um, we require expertise that are able to, to reflect the different perspective that the project brings in. So, uh, so as you can see, the, the aim that we, 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 we hope that we can bring through this project are at different levels. One, creating templates and uh, um, supporting uh, uh, the, the development of this framework, but at the same time, support conversation and make the world a, a bit smaller where we can support each other. And uh, this is one of the, the reasons that we are here today. So to listen your voice, your feedback, your question. And, uh, and uh, we are going to discuss at the end of this workshop and thinking about you, you know, your suggestion and your example, uh, because we are learning through this journey. Uh, Clara, I just noticed that Monica took her mute off. I just wondered whether you were uh, wanting to say something when we were taking um, up your time. Uh, Thank you, Corinne. Um, this is, it, it's incredibly exciting and, I, and I'm sorry, and I look forward to listening to the recording to, to catch up on uh, the model and the earlier part of your presentation. I was in, involved in, a, in another one, so I, I had to come <laughs> a bit late. Um, and it's a very exciting area and I'm just wondering, and, and it's an area that I'm, I'm, I will be involved in, um, uh, formally in a PhD capacity um, and I'm wondering uh, can you imagine or is there any resistance to this this idea or this this movement or this 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 focus um, towards caring you know to caring for the researcher for the community uh, you know it's we're dealing with traditionally a fairly uh, established um, uh, system uh, with so with supervisors and, and ethics applications and so on. Can you imagine or have you come across any resistance to the <laughs> ideas that you're suggesting? Yeah, just, just a bit. <laughs> um, I think it's always the case, isn't it, when... Um, well, I think there, are, there are, have been many surprises along the journey and not all, all in the direction that we might have expected. So I, I first thought, and I think Clara and I, who were there at the very beginning together, um, thought that when we first invited people to a journey, we, we, maybe nobody would be interested. We really thought nobody would be interested, that, that maybe it was just us that were struggling in our particular little team with our particular little problems. And so as, you know, the first um, workshop, I can't remember how many were there, but it was, you know, it was a full house. It was, it was very busy. Um, did you remember, Clara, how many were there for the first one? Our initial target was, okay, if we have like at least 50 people interested on that, this is going to be a great success. But we, we, we end up to have more than 100 uh, people involved in the first conversation. And we end up that uh, 200 researchers from all around the world, you know, uh, help us to, to think about, mm. you know, research challenges. So, yes, yes. Corinne, was, you know, we were so, amazed by the number of people. Uh, and, and still it, it's growing. And, you know, Toby is our, at the latest uh, new addition to our, <laughs> to our Flourish team. And Toby came along to one of the roundtables and then went back to... Uh, the University of Lagos uh, in Nigeria and contacted us to say he was giving a presentation on the toolkit and would we be interested in uh, in linking in and so we went along and it was the most amazing conversation with people from all over the place um, and mm -hmm. so we really thought we would get pushed back at that level you know from researchers not feeling comfortable sharing some of their mm. own experiences it can be embarrassing people can feel a bit diminished or worried that maybe they've had an ethical breach and may not want to talk about it um might, might get in trouble um and so it was really a revelation to us that in, rather than getting pushback it was like a wave you know people just kept coming mm. and feeling reassured that there was a safe place 
to say, you know what, this is what happened. I, I did this. I'm not proud of it. On In reflection, I wish I had done something else. I didn't think at the time of what might happen or, you know, this is how somebody else behaved towards me or a team member and I did nothing and I, I wish that I had or I still don't know what I could have done or should have done or would have done, you know. So people had their stories and it was quite amazing. Mm. Some, some of the sessions were quite emotional with people talking about traumatic experiences, which I don't think some of them had actually labelled as that until they were in the room with other researchers saying, oh, yeah, we, we have that too. You know, we, we listen to these terrible stories and we, they stay with us. And so I think it was quite a, you know, there was an element of catharsis, but I thought, well, if it's just catharsis, they'll come, they'll talk, they'll go, we'll never hear from them again. But actually people seem to want to stay in touch and want to know what's happening with the toolkit. And I get emails saying, you know, have you got the website up yet? And um, we were really determined, for example, that the website, uh, the, the toolkit, the short version is now in 11 languages. And we've been absolutely dedicated to making sure that we keep having it translated as often as we can so that it's accessible because it seems like it's a conversation that people will join if we provide space for them to join. And interestingly, from institutions, um, I think it has really been important that we engage with institutions from the beginning. So as I say, when we first started, it was at the University of Edinburgh. And so we invited along all of the ethics lead to these conversations. Um, we asked them what some of the struggles were for them in, in assessing applications and stories would come out about how they were worried that maybe they weren't skilled in the right way or didn't have the right expertise to address complex international multidisciplinary, um, you know, longitudinal um, projects involving lots of communities and so it, it was an opportunity then for the ethics committees and and those in positions of responsibility and accountability to acknowledge that maybe they're feeling a bit out of their depth and that they're not really well supported or skilled up either and so they have walked alongside us now the the ethics committee at edinburgh has been amazing in fact they have pushed through the funding for the second round you know gcrf funding has been amazing and they, they just keep supporting us to make sure that we keep developing the toolkits and the opportunities for ethics committees but also for um, the executive who are responsible for research in the universities to have new ways to help them understand and address and engage with the challenges that their researchers are experiencing so i think there is a recognition that mm. there is a sector-wide change in practice and mm. change in requirement and therefore a change in culture. It was almost like once we opened the door, people have just been waiting <laughs> for an opportunity mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. part of a change process. Mm -hmm. So uh, this phase two is very much about working with institutions, working with NGOs, working with communities around the world. In you know, Chris has taken on South America. We have Toby in action in um, Nigeria and Malawi. Um, Clara is in Italy. Um, we are working in Edinburgh there will be other people who will become part of this journey with us so that we it's an offering it's a gift you know we're, we're not going knocking on doors saying you must do this you must change you you know what you're doing is terrible we, we invite the conversation um, acknowledge the struggles that everybody's having mm. and offer for people to be part of that uh, solution finding process and that the toolkit helps us all walk through it that's what it's designed to do is it's designed to be a process it's not designed to tell you what the right thing to do is because the right thing here might be different than the right thing somewhere else and that might be different than the right thing you know in six months from now so COVID for example has also been a really powerful challenge mm -hmm. to how we do research who we do it with when we do it, should we do it? Um, it's been a powerful challenge for ethics committees. Should we fast track approvals because we've got a global pandemic and we need some solutions? But what if we fast track it and it has unintended negative consequences because mm -hmm. we didn't take the time? Um, what about the legacy impacts down the road? So COVID in some senses has, again, opened another door to invite people in, in a non-judgmental, safe way. We've mm -hmm. had people acknowledge all sorts of... Um, poor choices, <laughs> you know, regrets, <laughs> you know, um, stuck points, uh, inaction, you know, choosing to look the other way because it was too hard to know what to do. Um, and we're not, we're not here to judge it. We're just mm. here to acknowledge it and use that walkthrough toolkit process to unpack it and analyze it. And then to look at where 
we can find solutions from the, the four P's that we've talked about, the, the place, the people, the principles and the precedent. So it's a, it's a long-winded answer, but, but basically less pushback than you might think. <laughs> and, um, and where there has been pushback, it's usually, you know, that kind of initial defensiveness that once people know that we're not there to judge or to, you know, to get them into trouble, um, then they can find their way past it and, and engage with it. Mm, so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is exciting. It does feel like that to us. Wafa. Yeah, I just wanted to know, is this, um, is this work mainly with psycho community psychologists around the world? Or, um, I mean, I hear you talking about ethics committees in general. So is it, um, does it involve research communities across the board? Yes, so we've got more than 60 discipline areas represented in our, in our group, um, more than 30 countries now, I think. And so that, that includes um, people who are also practitioners as well as who are researchers and some who are practitioner researchers. Um, we have, um, I guess, stretched it a bit further in this second phase to include NGOs, um, and broader community related organizations so that you know it is an inclusive process because I think you know there's no point working with one small discipline area on this if they are then going to find themselves working alongside a different discipline area um, or with a different kind of organization it's really helpful if this toolkit and we've made it freely available the website's open access and everything on it is open access um, as will be the, the tools that we're working on at the moment to, to upload. Um, because we would encourage people to say, you know, I, I'm a community psychologist, I'm working in this area, but hey, look, I'm working with an engineer. And, um, or in, in the case of our original project, we were working with agricultural scientists, right? We're psychologists, agricultural scientists, we speak a different language. And this process, this toolkit gave us a shared language where we could come together around a shared process to acknowledge what the difficulties were that we were experiencing, develop a shared language around it, and then find mutual solutions. So it, we've really tried to not keep it to one discipline. Or, and it's been fascinating, actually, because, you know, as you can imagine, having mathematicians in the same room as sociologists in the same room as uh, medicos um, has been quite grounding, I think, for everybody in the room. Because, in fact, when it comes down to that experience of what it's like to be working in a challenging space and trying to you know really hold an ethical frame as a researcher it doesn't really matter what your discipline is <laughs> it's it's personally and professionally very challenging and so we we kind of have a shared starting point for for that conversation so we, we, we spend quite a bit of time indeed to uh to receive feedback from, from uh, everybody involved in the conversation about the language. Because again, we, we didn't want to represent one single discipline, uh, but again, when we work in global uh, projects, we most of the time we work in multidisciplinary projects. So we needed to be, to be sure that uh, the language that we use was enough, clear and inclusive. And again, I, I think another key word for us is inclusiveness and accessibility. And uh, this is the reason that we have the website, uh, the pocket guide in uh, uh, many languages, and we hope that we can translate it uh, even more. And um, uh, one of the other aim of the project is to create a training available for everybody through the, uh, through the website. Again, free for everybody to download and start in their own conversation in their own institution. So we don't want to hold, you know, anything. We want just uh, to be a place where we can share and facilitate discussion all around the world. So we, we as Corinne was mentioned, now we are in, in the second phase where Toby is going to coordinate the conversation in uh, ac academic uh, uh, in Africa. While Toby is going to start a conversation with NGOs and Chris in South America. But the idea is to make everybody then independent and uh, uh, in their own journey through ethics, but at the same time having a place where we can meet again and discuss. So everybody can get access and uh, through the, the email or, or a blog that we are aiming to, to have in the website as well. So accessibility uh, uh, is one of the, the, the key, the key elements of, of the project itself. Yes. 
Thanks, Chris, for sharing the Thank you. email address. Did anybody else have any any questions that you would like us to cover tonight? I'm, I'm noticing that we're, we're coming up to closing and I only have a few remarks to make. So I'm very happy to continue this little bit of conversation a bit further if anybody has anything else they would like to contribute. Okay, all right. It sounds like, it sounds like you're, you're all happy. I might quickly then run through the last couple of slides just to finish off. Uh, and to, I guess, highlight some of the points that we've just been discussing in, in this session here uh, before we, we finish up for the evening and I send you, send you on your way, either into the morning or into the evening, depending on where you are in the world at the moment. I'll just see if I can uh, share screen again. So I might just skip over. We've talked a little bit about the next steps for, for this project. It really is about stretching it out now to include academic researchers and NGOs and ethics committees to generate new material. Um, I guess just to I guess show the alignment between the kinds of issues that you've just been raising and the sorts of things that we're working on. Is this uh, a series of questions? I'm hoping that you can see this on your screen that universities and research institutions can support ethical practice in global research by making some changes. And that includes reviewing current university policies and practices to ask, are they still fit for purpose? Are they agile, contextual and solution focused? And the answer to that is by and large, um, no. <laughs> so there, there is work to be done, um, which is kind of fun for us to, to be heading into that space that through considering innovations and breakthrough ideas for ethical research practice, how can we engage our expert global staff and partners to share wisdom and create a global academic village? So for us, this has been one of the most powerful parts of the project is people coming together all, the, all around the world, virtually and in person, um, to think of ourselves as a global academic village. We are all in this business together and there is so much wisdom there to be shared if we, if we pull it. And in undertaking strategic planning and strategic leadership. So advocating for new paradigms with funders. We talked a little bit about that uh, before with one of the examples that Wafa had. Um, international research bodies and other key stakeholders. So for you know, at the university level, there is a lot of work to be done, I think. And hopefully the toolkit can help provide a framework for that. Paradigm shifts for university is really that ethics and ethics governance should be seen as an integral part of all stages of the research journey, including legacy issues, not simply a single point in time of approving uh, a document as, uh, as though that somehow is the beginning and the end of the ethical journey for researchers. I think that's an important part of the paradigm shift. That mid-project change or unexpected events shouldn't be seen as an exception or as a sign of poor planning, but an expectable part of global research and that responsive systems are needed to support continued ethical action. That there should be encouragement and opportunity for researchers to speak up when they're confronted with ethical challenges. So there should be both a, an approval part of an ethics process, but also a support component. It's not just approving the document. There needs to be support for ethical processing from researchers, given that we know this is going to be happening more and more and be part of uh, more and more of our, our, our research going forward. So the ethics should be seen as bound by regulations, but also contextual, that the right solution in one place is unlikely to be the right solution in another. And this is a, a, a significant paradigm shift for universities who are quite rule bound. Uh, in thinking about the rights and wrongs and also some parts of the world who usually are predominant in making ethics approvals because the funding bodies are sort of uh, tend to coagulate in certain parts of the world. So ethics committees in those parts have greater power to make decisions and I'm making decisions about different contexts that really uh, are not warranted in those contexts. So I think that's an important paradigm shift. So the question I guess to ask is, are these ways of thinking embedded in practice at your institution? Are policies and practices designed for the journey? Do we invest in circular processes to keep coming back and reviewing and reflecting on, on what has happened or do we just go forward and sign off at the end of it? Are the processes that support solutions and support speaking up and being open and honest? Are we designing fit for purpose processes? Are they agile? Uh, robust ethics processes 
again, as we said before, should have both an approval and a support component. There should also be independent review of all projects, not just having some low level, low level projects signed off by supervisors, for example. Um, considering innovations and breakthrough ideas, are we doing that in our universities? Are we actively creating a global academic village or undertaking strategic planning and strategic leadership and ethics? Um, not often. <laughs> And are we advocating for new paradigms with funders and international research bodies and other key stakeholders? So there's a lot of work to be done, I think. So I guess um, the first part of our, our conversation together today was really focused on the individual researcher and how the toolkit can be helpful for the individual researcher and for the research team. And uh, our conversation morphed into the second part, which is what do we do at the institutional level to think differently about ethical practice in, in complicated places. So I think that's, that's a, a kind of nice place to, to end the conversation. And I would just like to say thank you very much for making the time late in the evening for some and at 4.30 in the morning, I think for, uh, for some others. Um, it was a really um, valuable opportunity to touch base with uh, some folks who have not had exposure to the toolkit before. And we'd very, be very happy for you to log onto the website and perhaps uh, think about being, becoming part of our network if you're interested to know about new developments as the toolkit um, takes shape. Uh, and we'd also be welcome your contributions to, uh, to the blog to let us know what the challenges are that you would appreciate uh, some support in or some solutions for or some tools to to enable you to work through that process more clearly. And I think I'll, I'll get the rest of my team just to wave and say goodbye and uh, and then we'll say goodbye to the rest of you. Um, I hope the rest of your conference goes very well. <laughs>